Alex. I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the design of our rich text feature that we recently released. It's kind of a bit different from a few of the previous talks, more technical. Uh, I'm partly going to use it as a jumping off point to talk about um, some ideas we have at Automerge about how local first applications can work. Uh, but also, it just took me ages to implement, and I want to talk to people about it. <laughs> All right, so um, what is Automerge? Um, it's a library for building collaborative local first applications. Um, it's designed to feel like you're just working on local data in memory, um, but Automerge synchronizes your data with other devices um, and merges changes from other devices automatically. Um, that merges automatically bit should raise eyebrows because it seems like a thing you can't do. Um, so I'm going to talk about that by talking about what we do with plain text in Automerge. So the structure of this is going to be, I'm going to introduce plain text and what plain text in Automerge looks like, how collaboration with it works. Then I'm going to digress for a bit about collaboration. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the rich text feature we built uh, and then finish by talking more about collaboration. Um, all right, so Automerge documents are a JSON object or a JavaScript object, uh, in JavaScript at least. Um, and any string in uh, an automated document can be edited concurrently. So uh, let's see an example of that. Here we have two editors editing my favorite RFC. Um, and the editor on the left inserts this sentence. Editor on the right inserts this sentence. Uh, and just have a think for a minute about how you think, if we merge these things, what you think should happen. Well, here's what happens in automerge. And Hopefully, that's a kind of sensible thing. It's sort of what we would expect. Um, and we also do this with inline formatting. So I said plain text, but we do have inline formatting. I'm going to talk about why this isn't rich text in a second. Uh, but let's see what merging inline formatting looks like. Uh, OK, we have two editors editing this sentence. One of them makes it bold. Other one, you can't really see the bold very well there. Oh, well, this one's bold. Um, and this one inserts the word beautiful. And then we merge these. Again, think about what you would expect to happen here. And hopefully it was something like this. Probably not very controversial. Great. These are really easy examples that I've chosen here. Uh, what about something a bit more challenging? So let's say, again, we're editing the second paragraph of my favorite RFC. And uh, the editor on the left has done a bunch of small copy edits. They've added this is apostrophe, some things in parentheses. And the editor on the right has completely restructured the, the sentence, the paragraph. Um, and again, how do we think we should merge this? Well, it probably shouldn't look like this, which is what AutoMerge does. Uh, we've kind of lost all of our copy edits. There's a couple of random weird characters at the beginning. We can kind of see what's happened, but it's not ideal. So does this mean that we can't do local first text editing? I don't think it does, but it does mean we need to think more about what the context we can merge changes in, what context we merge changes in. Um, and this is where I'm going to digress a little bit. So a nice model, I think, for thinking about collaboration is that there are two modes that most collaborative apps have. There's a synchronous mode, which is a kind of Google Docs style where everything's very real time. We're all Looking at the same document, we see each other's changes almost as they happen. Um, and then there's a kind of more asynchronous mode, which is like Git, where we explicitly branch, make changes for a long time, and then explicitly review and merge those back in. Um, and I think I, I wanted to mention the, the linear thing here, where they, they, they mentioned that they had to, if you've been offline for a long period of time, they have to decide what to do. Um, so, the interesting thing about these two modes is that we have to do the asynchronous mode in local first. Like, you always have to decide what's going to happen if your user's been working offline for a long period of time, because you don't want to stop them working while they're doing it. But we probably would also like to have the synchronous mode in most applications. Um, it's kind of weird that if I want to edit a Google Doc with you, I send you a link and I type. But if I want to synchronously edit a Git repository with you, I have to start a screen share. We would kind of like to have the same system be able to do all of these things. Um, and that's what Automerge is aiming to do. All right, so digression about collaboration. I'm going to return to, OK, right, there's one last point here, which is that we're trying to make this asynchronous collaboration mode possible in Automerge as well. So here's an example of doing more asynchronous collaboration in 
a system called Patchwork, which is a, an experiment of the uh, ink and switch where we're playing with these ideas. So here we're editing my favorite RFC again. Um, is that going to work? Yeah, here we go. OK, and we make like some quite big change. And now I'm like, ah, uh, this, this feels big. I want to move it to a different branch. So move all these edits to a different branch. And then later on, I can go to this branch, and I review it, and I go, yeah, that looks OK. Uh, I think I'll merge that in. And then when we switch back to main, there it is. So Automerge is trying to give you tools to build both of these things at once. And I think, I think that's an interesting model. Um, so let's did that switch tab? It did. OK, cool. Um, so now I want to talk about how this all plays out in the design of the rich text feature that we had. So um, this project started uh, a while back when GoodNotes came to us because they wanted to add rich text to their application. Um, they're a sponsor of AutoMerge, so we work quite closely with these, them on these things. Um, inline formatting was pretty easy um, because we already have this peritext feature that I showed you earlier, which does inline formatting, but block elements were a bit of a challenge. So block here refers to structural elements, like paragraphs, lists, block quotes. Um, and these are different from inline formatting spans because text can only be in one block at a time. I can make a paragraph a heading, but I can't make it both a paragraph and a heading. But I can make something bold and italic at the same time. Um, but blocks can also be nested within each other, which affects the meaning of the document. Um, and then the final difficulty is that inline formatting interacts with blocks. So if I talk a little bit about that, um, we would expect that if we've marked a range of text as bold, and then, say, for example, a paragraph and the first half of a list item following it, and we insert some text after that first paragraph, we would expect the text that we've inserted to be bold. This is kind of a normal thing users expect in text editors. Um, we also don't expect to lose or duplicate text when we're changing block structure. And it'll be obvious why I'm saying that in a second. Um, and we also don't expect changing block structure to change the inline formatting. Um, so let's see. Um, why is it doing this? All right. All right. And OK, another requirement we had here was that this thing should be interoperable. Um, it's quite a lot of work to come up with a good model for this, and we don't want to have to repeat it across every platform that we're on. But we also want AutoMerge to be ubiquitous. Uh, so we want people to be able to build rich text experiences easily on many platforms. Um, so our two targets here are HTML and NS attributed string, because um, GoodNotes are operating in a Swift iOS environment. Um, but also targeting the web. All right. So just think for a minute about this. We're trying to model um, hierarchical block structure with these inline formatting spans and just think what kind of model you would use for this intuitively and how would you model this problem. I think one model that's intuitive to me and probably the one that a lot of people would reach for because we're very familiar with it is a tree structure like HTML. Um, so here we have a, an example. The root of our tree is the list, your unordered list. And then we have our three list items. And then two of those list items have bold spans on them, which are children of the list item nodes. One thing to note here is that the bold span, probably from a user's perspective, is a single thing. It covers all of the second list item and half of the first. But they probably don't see that as two things. Um, the way that you might, another way you might represent this, which is also a tree, and the way you'd see this in JavaScript is something like this. There is different versions of this, but uh, lists of maps of lists of maps. All right, so let's talk about why this is difficult. Uh, so we're editing this simple document. We have a, a paragraph node. The node on the left wraps it in a, a list item. They turn this into a list item, and they add the word beautiful. The node on the right just splits the so the replica on the right just splits the paragraph. Um, so if we're representing these two things as trees, and we think about the operations that we would need to apply, it might be something like this. On this side, we change the type of the root node to unordered list. We delete the children, and we insert some new children. Whereas on the right, we delete the word world and append a new paragraph element with the text world in it. This is kind of complicated. Like, the users did some fairly simple things, but we've 
we've generated all these extra operations to manage the tree. And when you think about how you would merge these things, how would you smoosh them all together, it's not clear. And one model that, I, that you often see in these kind of representations of rich text is something like this. We merged the changes from the first node, first replica, which deleted the, which changed the type of the first node in the list and inserted some children. But then we also have this second element that the second replica inserted, and so we've duplicated some text, which is why I mentioned that we don't want this. Um, so the next example, I'm going to talk about how we're going to do that with formatting spans. If you imagine the, all this complexity of tree structures, and now we're also going to add sp formatting spans that can overlap tree elements. I'm actually not going to do that. It'll take ages. So all right. We tried to find a simpler model than this. We already have all of the characters in a sequence, and we have formatting spans that cover them. So rather than changing the model entirely, we just add one more character, one more element, which is a special block marker character. So instead of a tree representation, like on the left, we have this on the right. Everything between one block marker and the next is part of that block. A block marker has a type which tells you what the text following it is. And this has like a couple of nice properties. Um, the modifications of it map very directly to the things that users do. Splitting a block by pressing carriage return at the end of a carriage return enter at the end of a list item <laughs> um, is inserting a block marker, whereas merging two blocks by pressing backspace at the beginning of a list item is deleting a block marker, and changing the type of a block is just changing the type of a block marker. Um, we still have one very important element of rich text here that we haven't addressed, which is the nesting of blocks. And to achieve that, we just have this parents array of parent block types. One important point about that is that the parent block type doesn't have to appear previously in the document. So in this document here, if we just had the second block marker and line two, we would still render, when we're rendering to HTML, two list items. Because the user who was editing at that point expected there to be two list items. We're trying to maintain the context that they were editing in. Um, all right, great. So let's see what this looks like. So this is the example I was talking about earlier. So we insert the word hello world. We share this at this point. And now we disconnect. The node on the left adds hello beautiful world and then makes this into a list whilst the node on the right just splits the block. And we get something that we expect. Nice. Um, this also plays nicely with formatting spans. So here we go. We're going to have a, a document with a paragraph, and then uh, we're going to create a list here. All right, and now we're disconnected. And on the left, we're just going to create a bold span that covers multiple block boundaries. And on the right, we're just going to insert some new text. And when we merge that, the inserted text is bolded in the way that we would expect from the bold span on the left. And all of these things cross block boundaries. Thank you. Um, OK, so why does this matter? Like I, back to talking about collaboration. So most of these problems are only relevant when you're doing asynchronous work. If you are using a map representation of rich text and you're in synchronous communication, most of the time you won't encounter these problems because it's very difficult to concurrently create a structure change and a text change and or a formatting change before other people have seen half of those operations. So, um, but when you are doing asynchronous work, no algorithm is going to help you resolve conflicts, that you are going to have fundamental disagreements on what actually you want the work product to be. Like you're working on an essay, and someone changes the structure, the ordering of things, or, and someone else changes the actual wording of things. You need to actually talk to figure out what you want to say. But that, that's good. That's what collaboration is. So th what we want to do is provide tools that minimize the amount of noise that you have to deal with in those asynchronous workflows. Um, 
And so here we've got a model where modifications of the rich text structure match quite closely to the things that the users originally did, the, the low-level editing actions. And so this produces nicer diffs when you're comparing different versions of a file, comparing what changed. And this is more broadly what we're trying to do with AutoMerge in general, is provide good tools for visualizing and understanding how a document has changed. Because version control, I think, is a good model for a lot of local-first applications in general. Like, we've talked a lot about sync and synchronizing data between devices, but this still doesn't actually help you if those devices have done diverging things, and you need to have a, a model for understanding what to do in those cases. Um, I'm not going to say the acronym, but the acronym that smushes everything together still won't help you here, because you need to actually figure out what you all want to do. Um, so, oh, I think it's lost my conclusion. Look at that. OK, right, well, there we go. So I think version control is an appealing model for a lot of local source software. I think it works well in scenarios where you have most of your users are both reading and writing. You're working on data that moves at human speeds um, and is human-sized. Um, so you don't have these like partial sync problems. And those are the main two. <laughs> um, but I think it has to be good. So version control, we think about version control as Git. And the idea of exposing Git to, well, to anyone, really, but especially to, like, <laughs> to non-programmers is, uh, is not, is not going to make a good product, I think. But Git has taught us that version control is difficult, but I don't think it has to be. And I think building good tools for version control uh, is, it could be really compelling. Um, and not just for text. Like, we want version control for everything. Like, most people are working on something more complicated than text. And we want these things to smoothly transition from synchronous to asynchronous collaboration. All right, I put a roadmap slide there that I wasn't going to do in case, unless I felt like it or had lots of time, but I have some time. Um, so this is uh, some things that we are working on at AutoMerge, which people might be interested in. So one is more performance work. Um, editing performance works pretty well. We all live in AutoMerge every day at Ink and Switch. Um, but memory usage is still pretty high. We have some initial prototypes that reduce this by 100 times. Um, so we should be able to get to a, to pretty good numbers on memory usage. Um, we're also working on sync improvements. We have a lot of use cases where we are synchronizing hundreds, thousands of documents, and you, this obviously introduces sort of head-of-line blocking problems and various situations where you want to be able to say, do I have all of the documents that I would possibly need in order to be able to go offline here? Um, so uh, we're just starting work on a new protocol to, protocol to solve this problem. Um, and we're working on a extension and a, and a new kind of authentication authorization for local first applications. This is like a new project that has, we're just kicking off, but uh, aiming to solve some common problems we see people have with AutoMerge or local first applications in general, where you can use existing systems that you are used to using. You just authenticate a WebSocket and have a central server, say. But we want something that's truly local first and doesn't require that. Um, yeah. There you go.